Hey, what's up? Freeway Frank with a previously unreleased episode of the Drive-By Podcast. I sat down with denim legend Sal Parasuco earlier this year and released it only via audio. So here it is, a special treat. It's a video edition, YouTube, episode 111, previously unreleased here on the Drive-By Podcast. It is sponsored by Les Delices Lafrenet, five great Montreal locations, including the newly expanded one on Tashro Boulevard in the South Shore, Les Delices Lafrenet. Frenet Brassard. Check them out with Italian products straight from Italy and it is the holiday season and they'll hook you up with the best pastries and cakes always available on display whether frozen or freshly baked and right in front of you as you check out. It's Les Delices La Frenet. This is the Drive-By with Freeway Frank. Right, so usually I start the podcast by saying whoever the person is on my show is at my house. But now Sal Parasuco is not at my house because I have a brand new studio in downtown Montreal. And Sal is here in the man cave. Mr. Parasuco, denim, God, icon, how are you? Well, I wouldn't say God. That's a big word. Yes. G- a denim God? That's good. Denim legend. Legend. That's what they call me. They actually labeled you that. Denim That's, legend. Who's they, by the way? Uh, I guess the industry in general, because of uh, all the innovations we've done in our past uh, since 1972. You know, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but I'm aware. I think <laughs> very I aware was, of you. Uh, I opened. My, I started working in the store when I was uh, 14 years old. I uh, snuck my way into getting a job, and even though the guy didn't want to hire me, I says. I'm here. Just let me work. Yeah. If you like me, you tell me. I, you like me. If you don't like me, you don't have to pay me. And I got the big job of washing the floors and washing the store. Where was this? You know where uh, Place des Jardins is now? Before Place des Jardins, okay. it used to be uh, like two-level buildings. Ground floor was retail. Yep. And uh, second floor was uh, apartments. Mm-hmm. Not apartments, but single dwellings. Uh, in front of Place des Arts. Amazing. And we're talking about 1968. I got my first job there. Yeah, see, so now we could talk since you mentioned a year. Sal, you just had a big birthday, and I wish you the best. Bon compliant. You just turned, this is freaking incredible. This man just turned 70 years old, and you look, like I swear <laughs> to God, if I didn't know you personally, because we've, we've hung out together, we've even had yeah. moments together in Italy, which I'm sure will come up later. But you look fantastic. What is the secret? First, before we start talking about you know, your career, where you started, because I have a lot of questions about that. Um, how do you stay so young? What's, what's, I guess, doing what you do? I need stress. Yeah, you need a little stress. <laughs> if I don't have stress, you know, it doesn't burn calories. Yeah, I guess. That's what, that's what it is. That's why I'm turning gray. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, I have a great family life. I have a great wife. We've been together. We know each other. We're married 33 years, almost 33 years. But Rosie. We, yeah, Beautiful. Rosie. But we're together since, I guess, 1973. And uh, we're very careful about our health, what we eat. I mean, how many guys you see coming out of a Ferrari with a bag and a knife picking Chicoria down the street? <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> That's me. That's if you ever see, wait, If wait. you ever see a guy <laughs> coming out of a Ferrari in the middle of a highway somewhere... <laughs> <laughs> that is funny because I see, you know, the, I, I don't want to say it now, but it's usually old Italian men. Yeah. You're not an old Italian man by any means. I answer. am old. I'm well, 70. I'm, okay. You're 70, but you do not look like an old. I, <laughs> I didn't think Sal Parasuco was cutting Chigori off the side of the mat. I tell you, when, we, when I was a kid, because <laughs> we were a big family, six kids, and uh, we kind of supl- supplemented our, uh, our budget between April 15 to June 15, when Chikoria season was in, eating Chikoria, and I hated it because that's what we ate a lot yeah. of. And today I would pay anybody to uh, give it to me. Right. To, to uh, prepare Today's it expensive. for me. Yeah. If you, well, don't, do it, if the you wild, don't do it on your own. <laughs> the, 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 the one you buy in the grocery in the supermarket is not the same. Not the same at know. all. Let's explain it for the, uh, the Inglesi, the English people who don't quite know what Chicoria is. It's weeds. It's weeds, literally weeds. Yeah. But Dan- who eats weeds? Dandelion we do. weeds. Yeah, dandelion. Not only Italians, even Asians, because right. a lot of people make teas. Yes. And you know, it's uh, something that cleans your body. It really does. It cleans your... People talk about liver. 
but you get your spleen is just as important. And, you know, it. Uh, why you got to go to a grocery store and get medical medication that's chemicals to do a body cleanse yeah when it's back in your backyard in your backyard off the highway and uh <laughs> these uh, chemical companies are killing uh, giving us weed killer to kill it instead people should be teaching educating people that you eat it at a certain point yeah and if you, you boil it too it's that's what that, i that, do that's what you're saying uh, yeah the asian cultures do that and sal does it as well and you make the teas because yeah. even uh, i cook mine the way you uh cook uh vegetables yeah. and uh the broth becomes my tea yeah i'm thinking with all the the landscapers where you live in westmont you don't see too many chigaria growing anywhere so i would imagine when you do pull over it's nowhere in no your, you're in wrong you see right now because yeah? now's the season oh this is the season yeah, yeah. before they start putting <laughs> that treatment on their grass just make sure like frank sinatra's uh not frank sinatra frank zappa <laughs> yeah. make sure you don't go where the doggies go exactly yeah or else you'll be uh, having an extra treat in but it your, take, it's, in a it's a lot it of work it's a lot of cleaning it's uh yeah absolutely but it's all worthwhile sal you came through where i am here in uh, downtown montreal we're at the pretty much very close to Westmount. Uh, did you ever think as a kid growing up, where did you grow up, first of all? What part of Montreal? I grew up in uh, Hochelaga Mercier, which okay. is uh, near Frontenac in Ontario. Yeah. And uh, there was hardly any Italians there. So my, when I arrived here in 57, I was almost four years old. My second language was really French. And when I went in, enrolled, when it was time for school, when we went to enroll at school, we got refused in French school. And I had to go to English school, and it took me two years to learn English. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're still learning it, Sal. <laughs> but meaning it's, me but, too. <laughs> but it's the it's the best thing that happened because yes. we ended up keeping our maternal language because our parents didn't speak English or French; they spoke Italian. Exactly. In my case, Sicilian. Yeah. And we learned two languages, and we learned uh, so we became fluent in three. It's an amazing story, your story, Sal, because you know where you grew up, and you you came here as immigrants who were born in Sicily. And then th this was obviously a natural question that came to mind right away. Did you ever think, you weren't motivated by where you thought you were gonna live one day, what you were gonna drive. I'm sure your success, you know, it's derived by the fact of wanting to be the best at what you do, right? Most well, first it was uh, figuring out what I wanna do. Yeah, no? which we're gonna get into. But you know, when my point is that you pulled up here 10 minutes ago in your gorgeous Ferrari. You came from Westmount, where you live. Still live there, right? Yes. Am I not supposed to mention that? Don't, don't go bother Sal, by the way. <laughs> he doesn't need any more groupies. He's had enough in his, uh, in his life. And he's married 33 years. 33 years. But it's a hell of a story. You know, you come over from Sicily with your family. You're four years old, like you said. And... Your mom was also making clothes, I think. I read somewhere that a long time ago that she was. Well, she started by making clothes for the family. Yeah, she, she did because uh, out of necessity, because yeah. we couldn't afford to buy clothes, to buy clothes, you know. But exactly. that's her generation. Everybody knew did how that. to make yeah. clothes, knit. I used to help my mother unravel sweaters, and she would use the yarn to make a new sweater. Unreal. So we talk about sustainability. Talk yeah. about environmentally friendly. That we, was the you were the original environment. We were there already, you know, <laughs> out of necessity. Yeah. So you see your mom doing this. What? Okay, you said you were 14 when you started cleaning floors and doing that. When did you first get the fashion bug? And, you know, I've never seen you not look great. You're very conscious of, I mean, you don't seem like a guy who spends, you know, 30 hours fixing everything, but it just looks good and natural on you. When did you realize fashion was going to be this important facet of your life when did you think well oh, this the, is what i want to do How one, did of the, it start? one of the interesting things i'm going to jump forward a bit yeah. is uh one of the interesting things i'm told by the people we work with uh, the retailers we sell to is say hey, you're uh, you're one of the only guys who wears his own brand <laughs> smart and it's true yeah you know okay because uh, i basically i'm proud to wear my own brand but yeah. also because i take it for a test drive right before somebody else gets you know before I started selling it to somebody else. Which makes sense. But the bug was uh, when I was in uh, school and, you know, when you're a kid and people ask you, what do you want to be? Uh, it, it was a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor because I heard doctors make money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a little better. <laughs> and then uh, I got the, the Beatles came out. We Amazing. got into music, teenagers, Elvis Presley. We used to go to the 
where was it, Rosebond Theater there and watch three Elvis Presley movies on a Saturday for 50 cents. Amazing. And uh, you got to look cool. So we couldn't afford clothes, but my mother knew how to uh, sew. My mother, and we even had a neighbor, another Italian lady uh, that uh, knew how to make the patterns and stuff. So I started to go and uh, figure out, buy fabrics and uh, get clothes made for myself. And uh, I was the best dressed kid in the school, you know. No doubt about it. It's still are today. <laughs> and uh, that's that's where I think, you know, as you become a teenager and uh, puberty and girls and this and that. Uh, and I don't like chasing. <laughs> I like to be chased. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Most you of know? the guys do the chasing. So you like, like the, to be. Like the flowers don't yeah. chase the bees. It's yeah, exactly. The, uh, so wait, you're telling me that Rosie chased you before... <laughs> You guys, yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I'm gonna have to have her on and ask her yeah. the same question. So you're, you're actually, I, we knew each other for over a year and a half. We didn't like each other. Really? Yeah, couldn't stand her. Yeah. She couldn't stand me even more. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> yeah, you were tough. Were you tough? Did you find? Well, because she worked for me, you know. Oh, she, she did work for you. Yeah, she came right to our me. store and uh, ended up getting a weekend job. I didn't tell her uh, why I gave her the job. There was a, there was a bus strike, <laughs> and she had a car. Yeah, we're talking about 1973. She yeah. had a car, and I had to figure out a way to transport my stuff. <laughs> so she used to drive them in and drive them. Home. So she was the driver. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable story, incredible. So then I got this job in the store, and I was 14. And uh, while I was mopping, I was looking around. And I says, hey, I could get into this. There's a future in this. I saw a future in fashion. Not necessarily as uh, opening my own brand or whatever, but uh, it ended up by 1972, I opened my first store. I was 19. And uh, when I had the, the first day were open, actually nobody wanted to uh, sign a lease with me because I was 19, but I looked like I was 12. Yep. <laughs> so I asked my boss who I was working with, I says, look, I got an idea. I want to open a store, which was in St. Catherine near Papineau. And I said, uh, I want you to be my partner. I says, all you got to do is sign the lease, take care of the paperwork. I'll do the rest. Because in my head, I said, I'd rather have 50% of something than 100% of nothing. Right. And uh, then you, the first day we're open and all excited, whatever. What's next? How do you attract the people? How do you attract the, the buyers? So in those days, we were taught to be hookers. Hooker means somebody's looking at the window, you go hook them right away. You start talking to them and pull them in. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> and uh, then I, I knew right away, I says, I got to give the people a reason to come to my store. And uh, that's how my mind works, you know, because people don't need me. They don't need you unless you do something special. Yeah. And that's how I'm always working. Even today, I'm always thinking about some, doing something new. So what happened is uh, we opened, it was October 72, and the weather was still good. And I had these uh, jeans, UFO. I was buying Lee jeans, going to New York, Canal Street, bringing Lee jeans because Lee jeans was popular and would, they wouldn't sell to me. I was a new kid on the block. So I was buying from a jobber on Canal Street and driving them back to Montreal, but I'd only make like a buck, two bucks a pair. And then I got lucky with a company called UFO, a brand that I was wearing uh, that we used to sell in the store where I worked. They gave me credit. So I brought those jeans in. And in those days, people wanted jeans that washed down to light blue. Okay. And those days was uh, the indigo was made from a root, from a plant. And uh, it, it, it was scarce. So only the big brands would have, like Lee, Levi's, Wrangler, they would have the real blue that washes down to uh, lighter blue. So the guys who were selling blue jeans that were chemically chemical indigo, after you wash them, they turn purple. <laughs> so I had these UFOs, and the UFOs, they gave me credit. I started having jeans in my store. But then they washed down because there was the uh, original indigo dye. But people weren't uh, buying them. They didn't uh, believe it, you know. They believed that the Lee and the Wrangler were okay. But there I was not making any money. Mm -hmm. So I got this idea because I was also doing the windows because we couldn't afford the window guys. So you were doing the displays, you mean? Yeah, okay. I was doing the displays. Wow. 
I built a store, everything for, we built a store for 500 bucks. Unbelievable. 2,200 feet. So then uh, I took my old jeans. I was doing a window. I says, you know what? I'm going to put my old jeans and the new jeans, the UFOs, so people can see before and after. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened is uh, customers were coming in. Hey, je vais avoir les jeans dans, dans mes trains. So I showed them the UFO. No, no, les autres. Les vieux. I said, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it's to show you that uh, after you wash them, they become like that. He said, yeah, but I want them like that right away. I said, sorry, can't. Then one guy, two guys, three guys. So then I started to think, hey, I got to get, let me see if I can get these jeans washed. I started to call laundries. Nobody didn't exist. Wa- yeah. Didn't exist. Nobody wanted to wash it. <laughs> so then uh, we had a day which was very frustrating. We had uh, hardly any, uh, the sales were poor. And I get the last customer I get that day is the uh, same thing. The guy wants the jeans in the window, the washed ones. So because it was a bad day, I guess it gave me a push. I said, hey, uh, okay, listen, I can get you them washed for, you. I can get you a pair tomorrow. It's going to cost you $2 more. Okay, but problem. In those days, people used to leave you deposits. Right. Credit like card. A lay- layaway type thing. Yeah, layaway. Yeah. There was no credit cards yet. Yeah. So I get home, I wash them. Bring him in the next morning. It was a Friday morning, I remember. First customer comes in, wants the jeans in the window. What size? The same size the guy from the night before. So I sold him the jeans. How much were the jeans? They were twelve ninety nine. With him, I got four, two bucks more because they're washed. Fourteen ninety nine. And then the guy at lunchtime came, the guy who gave the deposit. I said, hey, they're not ready. They're going to be ready tomorrow. I'll give you a discount, so come back. <laughs> so that night... I took home 12 pairs and took a chance, washed them all, brought them in Saturday morning, and they blew out. Next Amazing. thing you know, we're washing 200 jeans a week <laughs> in the house. And we were, my parents, uh, we were on welfare that time. Incredible. We were, I was on welfare, man. We were getting $42 a month. <laughs> Imagine that. And then With you, a family of six, so the, a family of eight, six kids. So did you naturally start being the earner? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, at age 15, I was selling jeans out of my locker in school. <laughs> Think about what people and kids nowadays and the kids since you being in high school have sold out of their locker. You were an innovator back then. You were selling jeans. It's, it's just an incredible story. Well, I went to my teacher. I asked permission. Can I sell jeans out of my locker? I need to make money for it to help my family. He says, uh, well, I don't know. We got to talk to the principal. So <laughs> talk to the principal. And I could see that uh, the principal was not really for it. And I says, hey, listen, it's the same question came out. Why are you selling jeans? I says, you know, my father was in the war. My father's this, that. He stopped working basically when I was 10. So I'm helping support the family. <coughs> I think I was in grade nine. And uh, I work at a store and I get these jeans from them. Like, uh, you know, and I... Uh, I think I can make some money by selling them to my uh, schoolmates. Yeah, and you did. So they said, <laughs> well, we don't know. I says, Mr. Riley, that was his name. <laughs> I says, listen, Mr. Riley, either I sell jeans or I sell drugs. You make the decision. <laughs> Fantastic. I says, I sell jeans or I sell drugs like some of the other guys. I says, you make the decision for my future. Yeah. So he said, okay, you got it, but we're going to watch you to make sure everything's kosher. No problem. Yeah. So I started selling jeans out of my locker, and uh, some weeks I was selling $80 worth, which was more than a teacher's salary. <laughs> Unreal. It's just crazy. It's, it's an unbelievable story. So Well, it's also about survival. It's about survival, and you were the original negotiator. You know, you're making deals right away. It's like you learned that because of maybe, like you said, this for sure, the situation that your family was in, and you wanted to help and you didn't want to be on welfare so that's that was the eventual next step if i don't do it this is not going to end yeah, well yeah. for a family of eight i learned a nice uh, proverb in my life in life you don't get what you deserve you get what you negotiate yeah that's a good thing so never give up negotiate no. you got to find ways no matter what no, i'll be honest you're inspiring because you know starting this brand new podcast 15 months ago now taking it to this new, new studio everything you've said the stories and what you just said is applicable. And anybody yeah. watching starting a business, it's exactly that. You know, I mean, you don't get anywhere without trying, without negotiating, without trying to get it to the next level. 
So Santana jeans, that's how you, so that's what you, you went from UFO. Well, to UFO was a brand we were selling in our selling store. Selling in the store. Then you started Santana? And another know. thing people don't know, my store was on St. Catherine near Pap, you know. Okay. And uh, next street was Champlain and the Champlain Maisonneuve was Telemetropole. Okay. You the remember, TV you, station. You remember American Bandstand? Yes, of course. They, they had the had French version. The French version, yeah. uh, which was Jeunesse d'aujourd'hui. So I was starting to dress those artists. Amazing. So one time the winter was like really freaking uh, no customers at all, you know. <laughs> and down three doors away, there was a, because a lot of people in those days used to sew at home, knit. So yeah. there was a store that was selling uh, sequins and uh, beads and uh, fabric and this and that. So I was, I was bored. I went to take a look what's going on, talk to the guy. And he says, you know what, give me uh, some of this. Let me buy some of this stuff. And I took one of my jean jackets in the store, well, because I hate it when there's nothing to do. I, I was taught to always do something. So I took one of my jean jackets that used to sell like for uh, 14 bucks, a Lee jean. And I started to dress it up with the sequins and the paillettes and uh, studs. Yeah. <laughs> and I hung it up in the window. And one of the, uh, the celebrities there from Telemetropol walked by, came in. And I got 35 bucks for it. Incredible. It was a score. Next thing you know, I took 10 jackets at home and had all, <laughs> all the kids, my brothers and sisters, watching TV, putting beads and studs and stuff. That's an amazing story. And uh, we could have been the first people to embellish denim. Yeah. We're talking about 1972, 73. Yeah. Yeah, you were bedazzling denim before bedazzled. <laughs> you know, exactly. You're way ahead of you were the originator. I mean, we didn't have Google that time, so no. I didn't know what was going on in everywhere else. So that's the crazy thing is you look at today and, uh, you know, brands that, that sell today and what they have, you know, from Instagram. And I know you guys are on Instagram too because you have to change with the times and everything. But it's incredible what you created with literally nothing. I mean, your display was social media on the street. Yeah. So it happened to be St. Catherine, but still, I mean, it, that was your social media page. And nowadays, I mean, th the game has changed completely. But going back to the washing jeans, you know, my, my parents used to stand guard because we lived in a tough area, yep. watching the jeans on the clothesline. You'd have up to uh, 200 jeans in a day. <laughs> and in the wintertime, we used to, we didn't have a dryer. Yeah. We used to hang them in the house and sleep under the jeans. We'd all wake up with red eyes from the bleach. But that thing, what we did, washing jeans, inspired uh, an international industry that created if not hundreds of thousands millions of jobs at least hundreds of thousands of jobs around the world nobody was washing jeans yeah is that incredible that that's all it took was why that's the what it took because because uh, what would happen uh, competitors would come to my store and they start bullying me where did you get these jeans i says why you want to buy a pair no i want to know <laughs> you have to tell me where you got them i says why do i have to tell you i have to be uh, courageous you yeah know? of course because you're getting scared of older people than you. They're coming in with suits and whatever. I says, well, I didn't steal them. So either you buy them or get out. No. I had to get tough. Yeah. <laughs> and it was my competitors. They couldn't figure out. They, How you were doing they it. knew. Because, you know, when you're selling to uh, teenagers, uh, uh, even though there was no social media, the word gets around. Gets around in the schools. Boom. Yeah. And that's how we started rocking and rolling. And then it led to more and more. And... Guys who were working for me, my brother was working for me and other guys. And you know, those guys in 1972-73, I'm still friends with. We, we, it's I, incredible. I just took a drive with a guy last week wow. from that time. And uh, by 75, 76, I had three stores. And uh, three of my guys, my brother and two other guys, went to uh, Italy for a vacation in the summer. And when they came back, one of the guys says, we should start our own jean company. It was his idea. Oh, wow. Santana Jean, Angelo Cordisco. <laughs> okay. I remember Santana Jean. So I said, uh, yeah, okay, but uh, I says, I could be a silent partner. I'm busy. I got three stores. So we became, uh, we invested each uh, five grand. We started Santana Jeans. But 10 months went by, nothing, ha when nothing was happening. Nobody was doing anything. So I started to get involved. Out of frustration, because there was a jean company that time, uh, Liberté Jeans, 
and uh, they were making this beautiful white jean, which was a sailor jean with a lace up in the front. And they weren't delivering. They kept saying, next week, next week, and I'm losing sales. Then I, then I woke up one day. I said, shit, we have our own jean company. Let me make it. They're yeah. not going to deliver. I said, hey, you're not going to deliver. I'm going to knock it off. So I made 600 pieces. And we were delivering from my house, which is near, at that time, near uh, Plaza Versailles. So one morning, I get a knock. I'm in the shower. My mother comes and gets me in the shower. He says, there's a guy here who wants his jeans. I said, what are you talking about? It's like 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> so I go to the door in a towel. <laughs> and it's Kenny Katz, the originator of the store's Le Garage, what okay, you know yeah, today. Of course. And he was my first order. I said, Kenny, what's the problem? He says, I want those, je- those pants now. He says, I'm going to bring them to you. Don't worry. No, no, I don't trust you. I want them now. <laughs> So there I was in a towel packing his stuff and, uh, you know, the garage now, the story, how big they are and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we started doing that and uh, the word started to get around about Santana and we had some original designs and uh, it kept going. And then it gets to, at some point, you make the decision to name it after you. When yeah, well, that, what happened, years, how did that well, what happen? happened was uh, 1986. Okay. We were doing good business. Santana was well known in Canada, and uh, my uh, my brother and my partner, we were then we were three partners because one guy left. Uh, I said, "Hey guys, you guys are married now. You got a kid." He says, "I'm feeling uneasy because I take risks, you know, and uh, I have an idea." He says, "You guys take over Santana, and I'm going to start a Parasuco brand. You know, you buy me out." Whatever I'm worth, take your time to pay me whenever you want. But it didn't work out that way. And we didn't have no contracts. But indirectly, I got shotgunned. We went on a year later. We went on through a year where I was doing most of the work. And these guys were, like, uh, upset. And I had to buy them out for twice as much as I wanted. Okay. Which I did. And I can't, I still scratch my head today how the bank gave me $3 million to buy these guys out. (laughs) Banks giving you no money today. Today, no. Yeah, it's a different world. No. Wow, three million, and you buy them out. And I buy them out, and then all of a sudden it hits me. I said, Holy <laughs> shit, I'm alone. If I get sick, what am I gonna do? And uh, uh, you know, that's one thing that's important. You pray to God to stay healthy. You gotta yes. stay healthy. Yes. Hence, you started drinking the chicory <laughs> dandelion always. tea. Always, yeah. So. You start with three stores. How many stores did you get to? I mean, they were everywhere. Okay. No, certain... those those days. Then we then I uh, gave up the stores in uh, like seventy eight. Okay. And I focused on the manufacturing. The manufacturing, but then when how many stores did you get to though? In terms of the our own, actual our own uh, stores. Well, brick and mortar under Parasuco. Oh, selling in uh, in other words, uh, what's the easiest stat all over the world? Like how many countries? No, so? we didn't. Our own stores, we didn't have that many. We had a, the maximum we had was twelve stores. Okay, but around the world, we sold over two thousand stores. Incredible, you know. And uh, but going back to that partnership, yeah, that was we. I went through like the blackest year of my life because my brother basically retired from the business. The other guy, he joined another uh, startup in Denim, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Basically, it took some of my people, my designers, <coughs> that I, uh, my product people that I had at the time. And I also had already like uh, people working with me in Italy who used to feed me ideas, mm-hmm. whether it was fabrics or this or that. And we had this uh, X-stitch, which was like a moccasin stitch on a shoe, you know, on the mm-hmm. moccasins, yep. to do on the jeans. I had the design in my uh, files for like uh, two seasons. Then finally I put it out. And the ex-partner who took away a couple of people from our place, those people took the designs with them. Don't, don't, uh, don't forget, we still didn't have computers those days. Yeah. So they physically copied everything. And we came out at the same time. And that guy registered, got a registration on that, si- on that uh, X-Stitch. So that's the logo you mean, right? The yeah, it's it's an ornamental stitch oh, all right. around, uh, yeah. you know. 
So I had to, uh, he sued me, but a vindictive lawsuit, you know? Yeah. Like he wanted to destroy me. And uh, I, I wasn't so scared about it because uh, I had uh, the stuff before him. And I gave it to, I told my uh, CFO at the time to use the lawyers from uh, Levi's. And I had to go off to China. <laughs> Came back, I says, what's going with the, that lawsuit? To me, I, it was frivolous, you know, because I knew the law. How can you get a trademark on a state that's made by a machine? Because if you get the trademark, the guy who makes, makes the machine can't sell his machine to anybody. Yeah. But somehow they got it. They got, it got passed for Canada. And my CFO says, oh, I saved us a lot of money. I got us a cheaper lawyer. That was the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> Whenever you hear that, cheaper lawyer. We lost cool. the case. It was I had to take back like uh, millions of dollars worth of jeans from all the retailers. And uh, it was a year of hell. Because, you know, I, I owed a bank three million. This, this was that. which? 80s? This was 88. 88, yeah. So, but that led me to uh, hiring new lawyers that I have today, which is Ogilvy Renault who didn't want to take me, Shout but out. <laughs> finally they took me. Yeah. Today they're called Norton Rose. Okay, and we're, big time, yeah. And we're together ever since. Yeah. And uh, Joanne Gauthier, my lawyer, came to my office and started digging everything in my archives, everything, and she found, she says, look, you made this 10 years ago. You have prior use. She says, but uh, I can't bring it into appeal. He says, if you would have had me as a lawyer first, you would have won. Well. <laughs> so... I said, you know what? I said, fuck it, let them win. I said, it's just a battle, let them win. And I was watching uh, the Grammys and trying to figure out uh, how am I gonna turn this around. So watching the Grammys, this, this new singer, Terrence Trent Darby comes on. Wishing Well, great song. Yes. Are you a singer? Can you sing it? No. Not really. <laughs> oh, we were not gonna sing it. <laughs> so I'm looking at him and I see He's wearing a biker jacket, uh, leather. He's wearing a white t-shirt. <laughs> he's wearing cowboy boots and he's wearing uh, Rip Levi's. I said, fuck, this is the new uniform. So I went back and I had uh, built, uh, got some new people working with me. And I said, uh, we're gonna do, forget about this X stitch, forget about this, that. We're gonna redecorate the office we're going to do a biker look, leathers and stuff. So I took, uh, I had a black door, black glass door. Uh, and I, I wanted to etch our logo, Parasuco with uh, Chimera. So I was thinking, where can I get this done? Then I figured out, you know, they, they do a lot of uh, the uh, shower doors. You see them with designs etched yes, in. Yes, yes. So I started shopping around. I found this guy, Atelier Saint-Denis, and uh, Saint-Denis and uh, Jean Talon. So I go see him. I bring, I, I send him the uh, the mirror. Yeah, I call him up. I says, hey, est-ce que je peux venir chez vous? Là? I want to see how this is done. So I, I start to see. He stencils it out, blah, blah, blah. And then he sandblasts it. I says, sandblast? I says, <laughs> I says it's abrasion. So I tell the guy, hey, uh, je vais t'amener des jeans, on va, on va sabler les jeans. The guy tells me, oh, no, no, je fais pas ça, moi. I say, pourquoi pas? Uh, why don't you, for the people who don't speak French, I want to sandblast the jeans. I don't do that, said the so worker. So he says to me, uh, he's the owner of the place. Yeah. He says to me, don't uh, do that. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible. I might rip them. I says, no problem. I, I, it's rip okay. <laughs> no, 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 he didn't want to do I says, here comes the negotiation. Yeah, negotiating here, here, here part. comes Sal. I said, okay, how about you let me uh, rent me time on your machine for a couple of hours? Show me how to do it. I'll do it myself. He says, oh, pas problem, no problem. He says, uh, look, I have nothing to do this afternoon. Knock yourself out. So I went home. I went back to the office, brought some jeans, started blasting, blah, blah, blah. In those days, everything was domestic. We did domestic production. Okay. And what there was, we dealt with a laundry called Dentex in Pointe aux Trong. Everything was done localized. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Amazing. Our jeans were sewn here, washed here. The only thing we had to bring in the fabrics. Yeah. Uh, uh, to an extent, there was some fabric from Dominion Textiles, mm -hmm. which is another story. <laughs> but it's a good story. 
So I uh, send these jeans to uh, the laundry, Dentex, and I says, I call him up. I says, listen, I'm sending you these jeans, five pieces. I says, uh, I need you to stonewash them with X amount of bleach, blah, blah, blah. That's it. And put softener, blah, blah, blah. So next morning, they're ready, and the guy calls me. Hey, Sal, what the fuck did you do to these jeans? They're so beautiful. I'm not going to tell the guy. <laughs> That I invented sandblasting. Yeah. Isn't that wow. Because if I tell him, he's going to call his big customer, Levi's. And I'm going to be the last guy in line to get my, right. that was something I invented. So I told him, oh, it's a new fabric I brought in from Italy. Already like that, you know? I had to bullshit. <laughs> Why not? So then I was getting bad service from this guy. Even though I was a long time big customer. Because he was more friendly with some other people. This is uh, another thing, you know, when your relationships oh, yeah. override you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but relationships with my, they still you, they copy my ideas. Exactly. So I started going there during the night to the laundry because they were like 24 hours. They had three shifts. And I'm uh, making friends with all the uh, immigrants, the uh, Haitians, the Indians, uh, a couple of Italians. So I saw I was in charge in the night shift, this Italian guy and this Pakistani guy, not Pakistani, Indian, uh, Punjabi, Mohan. And I was there Friday midnight bringing them coffees. I says, uh, what time you guys finish? He says, uh, around six. Okay, I want you to come to my office tomorrow morning, right after work. I'll be there at seven. We'll have a coffee. I want to talk to you. So it was Johnny and Mohan. I says, uh, how long have you been working there? What do you do? The one guy took care of the recipes, the chemicals. The other guy took care of the staff, the workflow. I says, you ever dream of having your own business? Says, yeah, sure. So why don't you? He says, would you be able to run it? Yeah, of course. So why don't you? We don't have the money. I says, here's a check. Let's wow. get into business. He says, if you need my money, I'm, your part I'm a partner. If you don't need my money, I'll give you the business anyway. So they started the royal bleaching. And then I said, you have to do something special for me. We need to get one guy. We're going to get a sandblast machine. And we got to put him somewhere where nobody sees him. <laughs> Lock him up. Because <laughs> we don't want nobody to know this formula. And we need somebody who's not going to sell the formula to anybody. So I had a year to myself of sandblasting. Wild. And then I did a leather, my first leather jacket which was copied all over the world. We did a leather collection. We were doing, those days, we used to have a show at Plaza Bonaventure. Okay, like the trade show. Type yeah, of. yeah, like what we have in Vegas, Magic. Yep. yep. So I got these, uh, these friends of mine, these graphic artists, Linda Hackett and Boyer, Linda and Michelle. They helped me make a booth. We did a shoot, biker. I got a Harley Davidson in there. And... Uh, when I made the leather jacket, it was like amazing, but I said, and it was $600 retail, 1989, 88, 89. I said, how many of these are gonna sell? I said, I gotta do this, the same styles in black, because we did a, I did a leather jacket, dress, a bustier, skirt. I said, I gotta do the same thing in black denim. So we called, uh, I says, but if I over the denim, because I had a lot of uh, what we call chachkas, metal trims on it, zippers, okay, yep. they're going to break in the machine or they might break the machine. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, I got to find a, a black denim, a blue black denim. It didn't exist. So I called Dominion Textiles that we're working with. They just bought the American company called Swift. I said, listen, I need you to take the indigo denim, the blue denim, and over it black. He said, oh, we can't do that. Said, what do you mean you can't do that? <laughs> you notice they always say they can't yeah. do it, and you're like, I'm not taking that for a, an answer. He says, we don't uh, die. Uh, I said, but you have two plants. You have one for institutional goods in, uh, I think, in Boharnois, and you have the other, the denim plant in Drummondville. I said, take your denim, drive it to uh, Boharnois, and over it black. <laughs> no, we can't do that. I said, I'll, send, I'll, I'll get a truck and drive it myself. No. So after many uh, dinners and beers with this guy, he uh, brings the chairman to my office. So I'm like freaking out here. I'm, uh, I think I was 35 that time. Uh, you know, I, I, I just finished high school. 
these guys are chairman, <laughs> these guys have got uh, master's degrees, blah, yeah. blah, blah. They're running a public company. So his name was Malcolm. He says, why do you want to do, uh, you want us, what do you want this black denim for? So I explained to him. Da, da, da. He says to me, okay, I'll do it for you, but you got to buy 50,000 meters. I says, look, 50,000 meters is quite a bit for me. I says, but uh, how about we make a deal that you give me 10, I'll take the 50,000, but 10,000 per month, not on one shot. He says, yeah, no problem. He says, uh, okay, so we started. And I made my collection, and uh, we pres we worked like we worked like uh, s almost seventy hours straight to finish the collection. I went home Sunday morning at uh, seven a.m. from the office, and I got to the show at nine a.m. And we ended up <coughs> because of that lawsuit, you know, and the the rumor in the city was Parasuco's finished, or Santana Jeans is finished, blah blah blah. We ended up winning uh, best booth, best leather collection, Amazing. and best denim collection, all three. Yeah, and that collection carried us for three years. We paid back the we paid back the bank in a year. Three and million in a year, amazing. The black denim that they didn't want to do became their number two bestseller. And now I was like the darling of uh, Swift Textiles and Dominion Textiles. You became the and best another <laughs> thing, and another thing we did for the whole world. So they came, the chairman himself with the salespeople and the sales manager and the uh, fabric designer came to visit me to show me the new collection. So now, you know, I was uh, not cocky, but uh, I, I earned my stripes with them, right? So they're showing me all those pieces of fabrics, their denims, and they're explaining blah, 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 blah. So I said to the chairman, I says, uh, now we're on name, name to name, first name basis. I said, Malcolm, you're wasting my time. What do you mean? I said, showing me the collection like that. He said, I don't understand. He says, you're showing me raw goods. I'm going to order uh, 10, 20, 30 meters each to test. I said, by the time you ship it to me, it's going to be two weeks. It's going to take me another three, four weeks to do my tests. By the time I decide, we're already into the new season. He says, so what do you want to, what do you want to do? He says, how do you expect, uh, what's the alternative? I said, show me a garment already made, already washed. He says to me, nobody does that. <laughs> I says, so why can't you be the first? So two weeks later, the designer calls me, Tony uh, Carno, which we're still friends. He lives, he's in the States. He says, hey, Sal, you know that idea about the washed uh, garments to show the collection? He says, yeah. I convinced them to that we now we like it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yep. When are you going to be ready? He says we want you to make the samples. It's okay, no problem. So I made two thousand two two thousand five hundred samples for them. We organized all the washes, but I also made them their own uh, brand, hang tag, everything Swift, Swift textiles, buttons, da 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 da. And away we go. They uh, quadrupled their sales because of that. Incredible. And now there's no fabric company that doesn't show you full garments. Amazing. But the sad part, your... the sad part is because we're not American or European, we're not written up the same way. This previously unreleased episode of the Drive-By Podcast, originally episode 111, is a bonus episode, and it is sponsored by Les Delis Lafrenet. Five great Montreal locations, including the original in St. Leonard. You could check them out across the island and on the South Shore in their newly expanded store. It is the holiday season, and they have everything for you for any party you're throwing this year, from cakes and pastries and pizza and coffee even if you want to stop by and grab a coffee great deli section it's les délices la Frenet. maybe you're getting married in 2024 or having a big life celebration whatever it is anniversary order your custom cakes as well online at les délices la Frenet.com. with with the stories you've told so far on this podcast do you feel in a way and th by the way you've told me some of these before most of them i hadn't heard you kind of feel cheated in a way, right? Because you're telling the story, right? And you're like, well, most of the world doesn't know. I was the guy who did this. I was the guy 
bare bones at the beginning, trying to convince everybody, no, why not? You get in here. Now's the time to do it. You did it. It takes, I'm sure, a lot of satisfaction in saying this, right, and getting it out to anyone to tell the story. But it, it is an incredible story and background that most people don't know. Even if you look up Sal Perusuco, and you do a Google nowadays, right? Right. You don't hear you don't hear these stories. No. That's why I love having you on here to talk about these stories because we all know. I mean, I don't know the background of the gene and denim industry, but everything you told me makes sense. I know it because at some point, everyone owned at some point, if not still somewhere in their closet or wearing them today. We'll talk about where Parasuko has gone. Everyone's worn a pair of your jeans. Yes. Everybody has a Parasuko story. Everybody. And there's a people that won't get rid of their uh, Parasuko wardrobe that they grew up with because they have so many memories attached to it. Exactly. You know? Because that's, that's one thing I always do is uh, I make the clothing I make, I want my customers to get compliments. If they don't get compliments, I didn't do my job. You know, we're not thinking about how much money we're going to make. We're thinking about we got to make the best product. And that, that has to be the key to success. Yeah. That these young entrepreneurs today, if you're speaking to the youth of today, this is very important what Sal is saying. It's not about, say, I think today, nowadays, kids, generation, and not to put them down because there's a lot of successful people too, but they're worried about you know, what they're going to get with the money. Am I going to be able to afford this? Am I be able to? They're not thinking of the being successful. With success comes the riches of success. That's not the way you conducted yourself, right? Ever. No, you never thought, no. this is what I'm going to own. You thought about making your business the best in the world, which you did. Yeah, because if uh, you do, you make a great product, people are going to come to you and uh, what's the, uh, how are you going to be evaluated? You're going to be evaluated by how much money you make, by how much profit that brings. Anyway. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's, but if you're thinking first about getting money that you're going to buy a house in Westmount and a Ferrari <laughs> and you haven't shipped your first order, yeah, you're screwed. forget it. Yeah. You know, but there's another product that we, that we came up with. Like we, I said, we started Santana in 75, right? Yeah. So around 76, my partner used to walk around with his uh, jeans with his button open on the waist. And that time we used to have a lot of walk in traffic, you know, not like now. People used to come to the warehouse and to pick up goods. To the actual store, yeah, the warehouse. So I said to him, I says, why, are you, why don't you close that button? Why are you walk around <laughs> with your button open all the time? I says, it's embarrassing. He says, because uh, it hurts when I sit down. He says, and, and, he, and he said, I wish they would stretch. Bingo. Bingo, there goes the light bulb. Says, Fuck, this is interesting. Make a gene that stretches. And that day, we happened to receive a fabric from a Burlington Mills in the States that was a 65 cotton, 35 poly. And because we were a startup, I, was, I learned how to cut. So we, we were doing the cutting. We had our own cutting to save money. Also, because how do you trust the cutters? You know, they tell you, uh, you know, your consumption is uh, 1.2 meters and they're telling you it's 1.5 because mm -hmm. they're stealing fabric from you. So... Uh, when uh, the fabric, these rolls of fabric came in from the States, from New York, I uh, was pulling and I noticed that diagonally it would stretch. So I got an idea. I cut the jeans in diagonal <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. They stretched. So I uh, made, uh, I took a shot making uh, 500 pieces and I called Jean Bleu, Alan Burlack. I says, it was, it was a Thursday. I says, Alan, I got a new jean. I need you to try it for the weekend. Nah, not interested. I don't need anything. I got too much stock. I says, come on, please. If you don't sell them uh, Monday, I'll take them back. So I sent him 50 pieces. That was uh, Thursday. Monday, he calls me. He says, hey, you know those jeans you sent me? He says, uh, I says, what, the stretchy one? He says, yeah, what about them? He says, they, it didn't work? I says, okay, I'll come pick them up. No, no, I want 500 more. <laughs> so we were onto something. Yeah. And we were instrumental in the development of stretch jeans. Yeah. We were the first to market stretch jeans with our famous Parasuco stretch jeans commercial. Of course, I remember that. And now today, you know, this year I regret. I think I, th I was looking at that and I said, fuck, I fucked up. I says, because <laughs> we had a small budget, like 20 grand. And I called uh, our friend there at CFCF and we got on TV, right? On yeah. CTV. I says, I should have found a way to find 50 grand and put it in New York. 
on a network in New York instead of Canada. Because mm -hmm. who started copying that stuff? We started in 76. 1988, we did our first show in New York. We were the only ones with Stretch. And right away, it got around the show. And next thing you know, Guest Jeans is making Stretch. Levi's making Stretch. Everybody's making Stretch. And today, name a jean that doesn't stretch. Unbelievable. Sal Parasuco, once again. Yeah. <laughs> it was you. <laughs> Sal, that takes, that's a testament, honestly, to your, also your listening abilities, right? You listen to people. Yes, you, you watch. Always. Your eyes are always moving. Because this, this gentleman didn't have one of his buttons shut, right? Shut. He had it open. That's, that idea came from that because you're, you're aware of everything around you and especially in your business which i find not too many people are that aware about things they start with an idea and they can't really i mean the, the best of the best yes but that is true entrepreneurship it really yeah. is and and honestly it's like some people have we all have a healthy ego right we all have an ego but yours is like you're you listen to the the person starting off and go why don't you have a business well here i'm going to front you the money if you need it if you don't need it i'm here for you the gentleman with wearing his jeans a certain way. This doesn't happen to everybody. It's because you have that ability and skill to listen, to watch. Did you know that there's uh, 19 rap songs with Parasuko in the lyrics? I knew there were a couple. Can we go through the list? <laughs> Do you remember any? Do I have to Google this and look this up? Where's You'd my have phone? to Google it, but uh, As you tell off me, the bat is Nelly, his song EI. That's right, Parasuko. Fendi Capri's and Parasuko's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh oh. Because we were instrumental in uh, the hip hop market, the beginning of the hip hop market. Yes. Because a lot of uh, hip hop brands got inspired by what we were doing. I'm and looking it up, but not, I mean, yeah, keep telling me that. Uh, then just there's wonder, uh, how another, many more. another song with uh, 1212 with uh, the guy from Wu Tang with Snoop Dogg. Yes. But then there's a lot of them are not very famous rappers, but nevertheless, yeah. they're well, there. The first one that comes up, there's a whole bunch of them, but the first one that comes up is uh, Nelly. Yeah. Well, that was the biggest one. Yeah. That's wild. You know, you see uh, John Bon Jovi or Parasuko. Uh, yeah. When he, was at, when he was at the inauguration of uh, Obama, the first election. Uh, he's he was wearing the Parasuko. Head to toe. And did, did, you did that? You you. No, we, no, he uh, just did it on his own. Yeah, because when we had our store on Crescent Street, yeah. you know, people would, uh, the race car drivers, the concert guys, yeah. they would all shop at our store. Yeah, I remember watching at the time that music television was huge and I had several friends working as VJs, especially one of them who's been on this podcast, Rick the Temp. And you, Parasuko, was all over much music. Right? Yeah. And you'd actually see a lot of the artists like Nick Carter, Backstreet Boys, yes, wearing, yes. all wearing your stuff. Well, we launched, Sonia Benezra launched Backstreet Boys out of our store. That was from your store when it first happened, that when they, they hit the 1994. Yeah, when they first hit Canada. Yeah, yeah. They were, they the got, unknowns. They got popular in Canada. Because then, of personal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we did the same thing with uh, Sync. Yeah. And I even financed their uh, one-hour video, their first one-hour video, because they had no money. Incredible. Or they told me they had no money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe that's that was the manager too. Yeah. The, the, yes. He was a big manager at the time. But and even Fantasia in uh, American Idol. Okay. We supported her financially. Amazing. So there's a lot of people that people don't know what we, uh, we've done. Sal, you have these brick and mortars, uh, actual stores, retail. And then at some point... I'm not sure if it was five years ago, six years ago, you went mostly, 2015, 2015. So now it's almost eight years. You went digital. What was the decision? That's what I have. A lot of people ask me and I say, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Sal. What made you finally decide? Were you worried about the state of retail and where these brick and mortar stores were going in general, not only yours, or did you think you could just move it online along with your warehouse that you have here and just keep doing your business because your business still generates huge amount of money what made you do it well the brick and mortar that we had the stores that we had the original concept when we first opened 1997 was good was correct we used to have lineups of people you know yeah then what happened is the the uh zara started to come in the h&ms the uh and we were still old school where we trained our staff 
And all the headhunters knew where to get good staff, Parasuko. You know, so we were losing staff left and right. It's very hard to uh, run the uh, the business, you know. And people say, yeah, but you should pay more. Yeah, but there's a limit because what happens is uh, somebody s- steals your uh, manager and offers them two, three times the salary. But they're going to take them because they need somebody because they're open a store. They keep them for three, six months. Then they throw them out because they get uh, another manager at Correct. the right price, yep. you know. And then the one we trained is too embarrassed to come back to us. <laughs> and the Zara formula, you know, try to get service at Zara. You don't get service, no. you know. You, H&M, the same thing. It's like organized warehouse sales, exactly. in and out. Yep. So that's the new formula that came in. We were not prepared for that. Prepared for that. And uh, we didn't have the team. And so in 2015 or 2016, I decided we, had, we were down to uh, uh, seven stores decided to pull the plug but we got bad legal advice they asked us to bankrupt the company the the, the retail company unfortunately it was under the same name it was parasuko retail okay because there's a competitor who had 38 stores who closed and you never heard anything about it you Nobody understand heard about your story. and he made money exactly i had no debt i had no debtors we were the only debtor except mm-hmm. hydro quebec and uh, whatever yep and we even gave uh, packages to our staff Mm-hmm. So we didn't really have to go bankrupt, but the legally they said, oh, you got to do this, da, 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 because otherwise they, whatever. And like I said, I'm a high school dropout, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm paying uh, smart people to do, the, your, to do the smart thing, but sometimes yeah. ain't so smart. Yeah. So now it's strictly still sold online and everywhere. But now it's sold uh, online, yes. We still sell to uh, retailers uh, mm-hmm. around here and there. And we also have a, a private label service, you know, which you'll find Santana at Costco. We've been doing for, okay. 20, for 25 years. Okay. And not only Costco, there's a lot of brands out there that we make, we make the jeans for them. They okay. come to us because we're specialists. So you just do the jeans and... Under make, their label. Under their so label. So we're selling. Okay. So that's a part of our business that's been growing is the service part. Now we're launching a new brand. Outer, I'm getting into outerwear, and it's a full collection, also including jeans and uh, eventually uh, footwear. And we're launching at uh, PT Uomo, June 13 to 16. In Florence. In Florence, in Italy. And it's a much higher end brand, you know, because the jackets go from, uh, let's say, 1200 to $4,000. Wow. It's under the name Parasuco still. No. S- SP Sal Parasuco. SP Sal Parasuco. Yeah. Amazing. So we have... Uh, we took a whole pavilion in uh, PT Uomo. We have a big video. You know, it's going to be sharp because we got a four four meter by three meter video screen showing our history, our Amazing. videos, and everything. We're doing uh, artificial intelligence uh, images and stuff like that. And then, you know, we we have a Blade Runner theme. Incredible. <laughs> so it's going to be uh, really interesting, you know. And and that show, it's very expensive, but it attracts people from all over the world. You know, and we're still got to be careful because half the people who come are people who knock you off. Right. <laughs> They're ready to steal your ideas. So we're going to be uh, vetting everybody who yeah. comes around. But it's, 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 we've done it bef- many years ago. We used to do because I had an Italian license and uh, we did that show. And we used to have, in 2002, we had a rave and we took over the airport in Florence. We invited uh, 800 buyers from the show. 5,000 people showed up. Italy, there's a thing. They, they hear about a party. We were on Where the news because uh, the, oh, I remember you the traffic this, from yeah. Rome to Florence, yes. from Milan to Florence, the auto route was blocked. <laughs> and they were saying on TV, they're going to the Parasuco party. Wild. Yeah, I remember you telling me, you know when you told me that story? When we were in Florence together. Yeah. We were there for a friend's birthday and you told me that story. <laughs> and then uh, Roberto Cavalli was at, uh, our, it was like a rave. Yeah. It was, you know what? Wild. It was in an in a airport hangar. You had we had the, the invitation were uh, boarding passes, and you had to go through security. Yeah, everything you know, like normal, and then you know the way it works over there. The bus takes you to the plane. So we had like a seven twenty seven. The front end was into the hangar, and the people would go up the back side and come out into the front end, and all the monitors on the in the plane were all the parasuco party, and you Wild. come down by the front into the rave. That ended up being 5,000 people. Yep. <laughs> and uh, 
so Roberto Cavalli is there and he's thanking me for inspiring him. <laughs> Amazing. And then his manager says, we better get the fuck out of here. We're giving him, we're making him look better than us. Yeah. That was a party that no one will ever forget, right? No, no. Were you dancing there too? With the, or no, you were just observing. Were you on the... Yeah, well, I had as to, a rave, we had but, to yeah. participate, take pictures with everybody. <laughs> I'm not used to uh, being a celebrity. I'll tell you, yeah. one time we, uh, another story, it's funny. <laughs> I was in Milan with my, uh, my licensee guys, with the sales manager. Mm-hmm. It was Friday, so he gets a call from uh, Sicily. We were sponsoring uh, the soccer team, Messina. And that season, they happened to be in uh, Serie A, the top they were becoming a contender. Yeah. So the mayor calls him from Messina uh, to uh, my guy, uh, and he says, how are you? Hey, sono qui. I'm here with uh, Mr. Parazuko. Mr. Parazuko's in town. <laughs> he says, ask him to come, if he can come down this weekend, Saturday, and uh, we're going to inaugurate the new uh, arena, soccer arena on, uh, in Messina on uh, Sunday. He can inaugurate for us, you know. Okay, he says, you want to go? I said, yeah, okay, let's go. Sicily is my place, right? Yep. So we land in Sicily, and there's two Chrysler 300s with flags on them. Pick us up. I have a habit of sitting in the front seat all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you going, sir? <laughs> so the, the driver says uh, in Italian, he tells me, you don't want to sit in the back? I said, no, I like sitting in the front. You mind? <laughs> he says, okay. And my sales guy, my sales director sitting in the back, the Italian sales director. And uh, we're going, he takes us to Taormina. Well, first to stop off to meet the mayor in Messina, where they start. I said, oh, yeah, I, there's all these paparazzis waiting at the uh, hotel where we're going to meet the mayor. And I tell the driver, I says, oh, there must be some celebrity here. I says, what do you think? <laughs> he, says, uh, he says to me, are you joking? I says, wow, well, what's wrong? It's for you. <laughs> Amazing. I was like oblivious. Yeah. I was going there like to do a favor. Meantime, these guys blew it all up. And uh, they like uh, programmed me tomorrow. You're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. This time, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we go to the hotel, Gran Timeo. Free rooms. I like it. anything yeah, that's free. free we love good. it. You know, it's I'm good. with you there, Sal. <laughs> good meals, everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the next morning, we get picked up. The same driver. You know, but we got four police escorts, motorcycles. I said, I said so I told my uh, sales director, I said, fuck, this is very serious. <laughs> so then I'm introduced to the owner of uh, the team who also owns the hotels, and he also owns the ferry boats that come from Calabria to uh, Sicily. Mm-hmm. And he's younger than me. I said, fuck, I'm doing something wrong. Amazing, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he had a PhD. You yeah. know what's a PhD? Papa had dough. Yeah, exactly. Not the actual certificate. <laughs> so we, we inaugurate this uh, beautiful uh, soccer field, which is basically <laughs> carved out of a cliff on a platform overlooking the sea. Amazing. So, so he, uh, the microphone comes, da-da-da, and he starts telling people, Mr. Parasuko flew in this morning in his private jet. Da-da-da-da. So my father's getting calls in Canada from our relatives there. He says, you didn't tell us you have a private, private jet. jet. <laughs> So he calls me, <laughs> what are you telling people there? You're going to make us nuts. <laughs> Too funny. So we have all these uh, cute stories. It's a, uh, life is not boring. No, you have a million stories and I've heard, Yeah, not as, not as many as I've heard so far today, but I've heard quite a you few. You know, my, uh, my uh, favorite uh, hero as far as uh, actor, movie star was Mickey Rourke. Okay, classic. So in uh, 1992, by accident, I, I had an agent in uh, a, a modeling agent or photographer agent in uh, New York who was a Frenchman, Jean Gabriel. And I was in his office because we're looking, working on a new shoot and I'm uh, looking uh, for models and photographers. Who do you got? What's going on? And he's presenting me this, that. And I see a book there and it's Cariotis and I'm looking through these pictures. I says, who shot this? So, oh, see, see, Mickey Rourke, see, si, uh, avec son sa copine. I says, uh, oh, yeah, I heard he's, uh, he, he likes, he's got a sideline of, uh, you know, a hobby, photography. I says, it's pretty good. I says, you think we could hire him? <laughs> she says, uh, yeah, why not? We could try. 
So he called him up and we hooked up. And then, uh, you know, I'm back in Montreal. I'll make you work calls. My, Amazing. Those times we had receptionists uh, with paging. Yeah. Mickey Roar. <laughs> Mickey Roar is on the line. So I'm freaking out. This is an idol, my yeah. idol. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on the phone with Mickey Roar. Oh, my God. Amazing. How do you keep cool? And then uh, finally we hooked up in L.A. and we uh, did the shoot. And not easy to work with, though, you know, these artists. No. And I had, to, I had you know, and I learned a lot with uh, him. Uh, so he says, uh, you know, we, we go on the, sh the second day on the shoot. He says, I don't like it here. We're going to go to uh, my friend's house in Beverly Hills. So we go to his friend's house in Beverly Hills, follow him around. And me, I'm counting budget, you know, yeah. time, this, that. It's How many <laughs> pictures we're going to get. So we go to this guy's house. He comes out in his robe. And it was a little bit of a cool day. We were going to do a shoot in the swimming pool. And then Drew's has been the guy. He says, uh, this is Sal Parasuco, Robert Evans. I don't know Robert Evans, but you know who's Robert Evans, right? Wait. So Robert <laughs> Evans says, any friend of Mickey's a friend of mine. Anything you need, let me know. Ba 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 ba. Okay. Very handsome guy. Very well spoken. So he tells this girl, his assistant, show Sal the studio. So she takes me to the studio, and I see all these, uh, you know, these Hollywood posters, uh, James Dean, uh, Bullet, Steve McQueen, The Godfather. Marilyn Monroe. The night before, I was walking Sunset Strip, and I saw this store, a shop that was closed, that sold these posters. And I said, hey, I'm going to buy some for our office. So I tell the girl, where did you buy these posters? Did you buy these on Sunset? I said, I want to get some, the same, for my office. He says, uh, Mr. Parasuko, you know who, uh, whose uh, house you're in? I says, yeah. I says, uh, Mickey's friend, uh, Robert. He says, you know who Robert Evans is? I says, he's Mickey's friend. He produced these movies. I says, what are you talking about? He says, he was married to Ali McGraw. He produced The Godfather, blah, blah, blah. I said, holy shit. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> And I didn't work that. I could have, today I think about it. In fact, I, I could have been his friend. I could have worked that. Like we would have blown up the business. Yeah. We would have been uh, whatever. Yeah. And uh, the next day he says, uh, Mickey says, uh, we need to shoot some pictures by the ocean. Let's go to Malibu. We're going to go to Chad's house. Okay. So Chad follow. <laughs> so we follow. It's a two hour drive, whatever. We get there. Beautiful house overlooking the, uh, on the cliff there. And as I walk in, I see, you know, you have picture frames on your wall. Mm -hmm. This guy's got motorcycles on the wall. <laughs> and I see my, did my table, my dining room table, the same from that idea. I a big glass top sitting on two motorcycles. Wow. So I got my, mine is a glass top sitting on two, two uh, cameras. So I'm looking around. So he introduces me to this guy, Chad. I says, hey, uh, you're really into Steve McQueen, you. <laughs> He's same thing. He says, yeah. you're being funny. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm being funny. <laughs> I said, sorry if I insult you. You know, I, I'm from Montreal. He says, yeah. Montreal, I raised in Tremblant, Mosport, you know, uh, Mont Tremblant. I says, wait a minute. This is, you raised, you're a racer. You're Chad McQueen. You're Steve McQueen's son. He says, yeah. Wild. <laughs> it's unbelievable. We're but I got this, yeah. I'm really, I'm innocent. I don't exactly. know. Yeah, exactly. It's wild. So we had, uh, we had a lot of uh, fun like that. Yeah, over and, the uh, years. And there's no... And, and what's interesting is uh, <clears throat> these guys would also feed off of me, you know, because I would give them ideas. Yeah. Sometimes you, uh, it's the last 3% you put in that changes everything around. Mm -hmm. So there's no stopping you either. You know, most people your age, 70 years old, they think about retiring, you know, golfing, going somewhere, you know, not going to Florence to work. To, to, to try something else, to launch something else. There's no stopping you. No, I, I feel uh, like you're just gonna you're you're just gonna keep doing this because it's in you and it's fun. It's fun, yeah. It's what fun. you do is exciting. It is uh sometimes uh it's always stressful. Yeah. Sometimes it's very stressful. But you know, I tell people <laughs> stress means you're alive. Exactly. And you got to know how to use it. And it, uh, you, you could turn it around to inspire you instead of uh, getting in a corner and crying about it. That's the key right yeah. there. Yeah. And most people get in a corner and crying about it, you know. Because, mm -hmm. uh, 
You know, I look at today's kids, you know, let's go back maybe, you know, I don't want to sound bad, but even maybe 25 years ago, we used to, we were always recruiting people. So I, I would say to the HR, says, this person's not for us. I say, why not? She, they were raised by a daycare. <laughs> you could feel they're you missing. Feel, yeah, something's... Another. They're missing the love of the grandparents, the mm -hmm. parents. That's why, uh, you know, uh, you take uh, China, India, Pakistan, these other countries, Vietnam. The grandparents are taking care of the grandkids. Yeah, they're workers. You know, and uh, the middle generation is, is working. Because think about it, you, uh, a kid goes to daycare. The kid, two years old, three years old, gets attached to the counselor, the teacher, whatever you want to call her. And that person decides to quit after six months. It's traumatic for the kid. Absolutely. They got attached. Mm -hmm. Now that you bring in a new person, it takes time to trust that person. And now they get, when it happens two times, three times, you start to lose uh, something that you can't trust. Yep. You can't trust people because they say they love you, but they're not there after. Absolutely. Whereas your parents are always supposed always to be there. there. Yeah, or your grandparents. But because of our uh, the high taxes, both parents have to work. They don't have time for their kids. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but you gotta, once you decide to have a kid, you got to take care of the kid. Mm -hmm. You can't just put them in front of TV with uh, video games and uh, a TV dinner or whatever, or a hamburger, and that's it. Yeah, or an iPad. Or technology. But that's you got to take them to pick Chikoria yeah, and all that stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why and that's why today's generation, I'm glad you said that, needs to see that. That's what you just said as an entrepreneur and somebody who's creator and you've done everything that you've done. We heard up so many stories here on the podcast today. That's what they need to take, you know, from from this today yeah. and know that it's important to raise children or to have like i remember my it really takes a village it to really raise a does. kid it does it does. it does take a village and i see the difference because you know uh, recently i celebrated my birthday in my hometown mm -hmm. i had 120 relatives there wow if you see the kids three years old four years old six years old 10 years old 15 years old the respect they have for their elders and uh, between each other it's unbelievable it's <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> exactly because sometimes there's the fear of God, right? There's there the is, fear. Yeah. there is. Now, nowadays, a lot there's no fear, right? It's a, there is, there is the fear of God, but not to the level that we were grew up. No, with, no, 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 which know? was not necessarily you know? <laughs> right either. But it did make. But it didn't kill us. No, it didn't kill us, and it made men men and women women yeah. and stronger. And you know, there's a term nowadays, snowflake, right? This is snowflake generation society. It's not. It's not to put down people from this generation. But, you know, the going gets tough. When, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? It's like you need to be yeah, strong. Uh, you need to have a backbone. You need to take criticism. Nowadays, half the stuff you said today, people would just fold in a corner like a deck of cards. Like, uh, you know, nobody like owes you a future. No. You have to make your future. Absolutely. And the more politicians tell you they're going to give you a future, it's a crock of shit because that politician's only there for four years. And then he's gone. Or then he's gone and yeah. everything changes again. Absolutely. So if you don't take care of, learn to take care of yourself first, how can you take care of anybody else? Yeah. And that's important, you know. Sal, I want to talk about this because this was a, some would say divine intervention, life-changing moment. When I first heard the story, I heard it from our uh, mutual friends. Then you told me the story. I'm not sure if you've ever talked about it publicly. Yeah, yeah. You have? Not have you... publicly, not really, no. Not, no. not, not publicly. No, not so like this. It'll be a first year on the drive-by podcast. But something happened to you. A big event in life happened to you and changed, I'm sure. Yeah. Changed the way you look at life. <laughs> Can you share that story? It has to do with the... Well, my favorite number... And my lucky number is eight because I believe in Feng Shui since I've been working with China for so many years. Okay. So even our, when I built our, uh, we built our uh, head office in uh, 1996, I, I uh, called my, my first agent uh, from Hong Kong there was living in uh, Toronto, Kevin. And he says, hey, I heard you're building a head office. Yeah, yeah. What's the address? I said, I think I, it was uh, 102. He says, 
What was the old address where you were on Chabanel? This is 125. He said, are you crazy? You can't go down. You have to go up. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? It's bad feng shui to, to go down. You have to go up. Mm-hmm. So I called the city, and luckily we had like uh, our zoning. We had three addresses. And one of the addresses was 128. So I called Kevin. I says, look, I got this address, and I have 128. Yeah, that's the best. Take it. <laughs> he, says, he says, you know what 128 means? He says, on the way to success, on the way to prosperity. Mm-hmm. And also, Parasuko has eight letters. So I had my uh, four, 2015 458 Ferrari, and the 488s were coming out. So I scheduled in 2018, I would get the 488, all eights. Mm-hmm. That's the one you came here? With. No. No, no, sorry. This is the... This is F8. Oh, this is the F8. Sorry, I didn't quite look. I was looking at you when you came out of it. I caught a glimpse of it, of course, but we're so, going to go out and see it later. May 9th, yeah. uh, I pick up my uh, 488. 2015, May 9th. 2015. So it's almost to the date. Very close. Yeah. No, 2018. Oh, 2018. 2018. Okay, so it's five years ago. 2015 was the other car, the 458. Yeah. Okay. So I pick up uh, the car. And uh, two days later, Friday was May 11th. I'm going home, and I'm on uh, on Queen Mary crossing the carry, and my light is uh, red. And you know it's May, May 11th. There's still a lot of potholes and everything. And that intersection is a is a bad intersection. A lot of people yeah. run the light. So my my light going east turned green. But I wait three, four seconds to make sure the cars on the carry have stopped. Mm-hmm. There was two cars that were stopped. The third lane, I guess, was uh, empty. So I start moving. I start going forward, slow, because there's uh, a lot of potholes. And it's a brand new car. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I feel this uh, white thing coming from the passenger side. And Because le- and, uh, there was, luckily, there was no passenger. And next thing I remember, I lift my head and I'm facing, I'm in the middle of the boulevard between two lampposts and uh, facing west. And I said, what the fuck is going on? And only today I realized I passed out. It sideswiped you? Yeah. It T-boned me. Like full impact at uh, 70 kilometers an hour. Totaled the car. The other guy's car was, so, so I looked up and I said, what happened? Why am I facing the wrong way? And I'm looking to my left, and I see there's a car that's all smashed, uh, smashed up. And my brain is saying, fuck, I must have got in an accident. I must have got hit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was feeling uh, screwed up, you know, because of the seatbelt. And uh, I think I got knocked out by the airbag. Today, I realized I, I must have got knocked out because I didn't know where I was. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe for a few seconds. So I got out of the car, and the amp- and. One thing we have in this city, first responders, man, they were there right away. So I remember this uh, guy coming up to the car because my, I had the convertible, so the, the top was down. Hey, man, are you okay? I says, I, I think so. I says, what happened? He says, that guy hit you, man. You're so lucky. What, what is this car? I got to get a car like this. <laughs> if it was another car, you wouldn't be alive. I says, he says, you know what happened? He says, what? He says, your car went up in the air and did a 180. <laughs> That's how I landed in the middle of the boulevard. You flew. Yeah. I says, seriously? He says, yeah. Then all these people coming around. He says, you, you sure you're okay? Yeah, yeah. I got up. I was a little bit uh, dizzy. And the ambulance guy was there right away. Firemen, police. So I get in the ambulance to, uh, the guy checks me out. And he says, how's your neck? How's this? How's that? Blood pressure? Ba-boom, ba-beam, ba-boom. Ba. Everything is, you look okay. I says, but... Uh, you should go to the hospital and get uh, checked for internal bleeding. And all I was thinking is we had a six, six o'clock uh, dinner date. Mm-hmm. So I called my wife. I says, look, I'm in a, there was an accident. I got hit, but I'm okay. Come pick me up. I'm at the corner at uh, Green Queen Mary and the Carry. So she comes. And this ambulance guy, French kid, local guy, Quebecois, Spoke better Italian than me. Wow. <laughs> I says, where'd you learn to speak Italian? He says, I went to Perugia. I, st- I studied there for two years. <laughs> wow. So he tells my wife, he says, Mr. Paris, look, I've seen a lot of accidents like this. People walk away and the next morning they don't wake up. 
He says, I suggest you go and get checked. I said, I don't want to wait an emergency on a Friday night. I said, okay, if you take me by ambulance, he said, yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, right front. take me to the Jewish. Yeah. He says, no, I got to take you to the general. I said, no, come on, take me to the Jewish because I got my files there. That's mm -hmm. my, my doctor's there. So finally, he gets the permission to take me there. You know, he's got to call in. And he takes me there. I says, with the ambulance, maybe I don't have to wait, you know. So they go to triage. They see me standing up. I says, you look okay. You're going to have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> so much for that. So I uh, sit down. But they happen to call me in five minutes. So I go, for, go in for, uh, they start checking my eyes, this, that, move your head, blah, 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 lie down. They do an ultrasound. He says, well, we don't see any internal bleeding, but uh, you know you have a tumor on your uh, right kidney. I said, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, you have, a, you have a mass about six centimeters. I said, impossible. I just got a checkup two weeks ago. I was clean. Oh, crazy. So from there, I called my doctor, and I say, uh, Ruben, uh, I'm at this and this. I got an accident. I'm at the hospital. They said, I, got a, I may have cancer. I got a tumor. He says, oh, don't get excited. You know, some of the machinery at the emergency is not that good. So I'll set you up with a proper scan at uh, Monday. So uh, go get the scan. Yeah. And it ends up being cancer. Uh. So I was lucky because I, I was thinking, I said, why did this happen? I have all eights and this, I shouldn't have got hit. Why did I get this accident? That's why it happened. Yeah. And then... Uh, I had to wait four months. I got operated. Luckily, we got it early that I had no, uh, no chemo, no nothing. And my tumor was on top of the uh, kidney, so I managed to save 80% of the kidney. And here you are today. And then, you know what? The daisies, everything looks like miracles. Yeah. Every day is different now. Every day looks important. Everything you see. That, absolutely. Absolutely. That event must, oh, you must, that must, you must think about that at least once a day, no? Doesn't that yeah, come yeah. up? Yeah, yeah, and for four months, the only people who knew was my uh, CFO, my brother, and my uh, wife and kids, nobody else, because, you know, you don't want every, everybody no. calling you and saying, how are you, exactly. how you feel, how you feel? But after the surgery, I text everybody, everybody was freaking out. Yeah. And even me, for four months waiting for the surgery, it was like, how bad it is, how good it is, we you don't, don't know. know. Yeah. But thank God it uh, worked out okay. That's the best story. They were all amazing yeah. stories you told today. That is the best uh, story because of its outcome and how it, you found out it saved your life. That's why we say you need a bit of luck. And I think the harder you work, the more luck you find. Or luck, actually luck, find, luck finds you, you know. Another expression I heard is, you know, you say, uh, looking for the right opportunity, mm -hmm. it's not true the right opportunity finds the opportunity finds the right person correct because 10 people will see the uh, won't see the opportunity but one person will yeah sal first of all i want to thank you for taking the time to come here driving here and being on my podcast the drive by you also brought myself and my wife a couple of this is the newest thing you're doing? No, this is uh, special. Is this? this is our birthday one. This is It's a special uh, exclusive. Who, who's on the... I uh, can't really see. Who's that? It's me. That's you? Hang on a second. He's saying, Frank, what do you mean? You That's my... Uh, that is you. Now I see it. <laughs> I can only see it from the top. That's my honest. picture from Womo, Womo Vogue in 2009. You know, I was the only Canadian on uh, Womo Vogue. There it is. Look at the back. The back is Sal Parasuko 70th birthday event, April 2023, came and went. Sal, Capizzi Sicily. Look at that. Beautiful. And here's the quote in the front. The quote is, your life inspires my life. Yes, it does. There's inspiration everywhere. Thanks, Sal. You just got to look. I really appreciate you being on the drive-by. You're invited anytime for even more stories. You're a great storyteller, and I wish you the best of luck. Please say hi to your wife, Rosie, your daughter as well. And... Continued success, my friend. Thank you. It's nice to be important, yep. but more important to be nice. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Thanks so much for watching this bonus episode of the Drive-By Podcast, originally episode 111 here on YouTube. 
It's Freeway Frank, and this episode was sponsored by Les Delis Lafrenet. Look at this great box. Now, this one is just a prop box. There's nothing in here because I would eat every single pastry <laughs> that would be in this box because it is simplement délicieux, simply delicious. Check them out at their five Montreal area locations, including the original hub, St. Leonard, Rosemere, Point Claire, Montreal West. And my favorite because it's the closest to my house and I can basically work there there so often with Anthony, Julie, and the crew. It's Les Delices Lafrenet Brossard. Check them out as well if you're ordering any custom cakes, any themed cakes for any life celebration. They've got it for you throughout the holiday season and in 2024. Wishing you all the best and a safe holiday season and a fantastic new year in 2024 from the entire crew at Les Delices Lafrenet. This is the drive by with Freeway Frank. Watch all episodes of the drive by on YouTube. Listen in on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, Podbean, and tune in.